They strike without warning, shaking the earth with cataclysmic force, creating mass panic and turning lives upside down. This building should not have gone down on a 6.6. It should not have. The terrible forces of an earthquake are the planet's growing pains. We can build structures we hope will withstand them and prepare for when they crash. You're going to have a lot of people injured, many people killed. But earthquakes remain the most unpredictable force of Earth's fury. At an observatory in California, an earthquake strikes. Holy! Holy! Oh my God! Holy cow! There's a larger earthquake. All right. All this astronomer can think of is Stand escape. By. As he races from his observatory, the ground beneath his feet appears to crack. Move it! Come on! This is only a moderate aftershock that hurt no one. When larger earthquakes strike densely populated areas, the results can be devastating. San Francisco, October 17th, 1989. The talk of the town this day is of baseball. It's the third game of the World Series, and the city is buzzing with excitement. At 5.04 p.m., the excitement suddenly turns to terror. Can you feel that? Here go the lights. Oh, my God. It shook a long time, and it just kept coming. And it kept coming, and it kept coming again. There was a loud, roaring sound at the same time the building started to collapse. And as I stood in the doorway to hold on, the ceiling came down and the walls came together, like, sort of like an accordion. And when I came to, there was a lot of rubble and dust, and I was laying on my back. When the shaking stops, Shara Cox lies buried beneath two floors of a collapsed apartment building. There has been a power failure. Therefore, the game will be postponed. The baseball stadium is still standing. It was built on granite. But Shara's neighborhood, built on landfill, is in shambles. Shattered buildings and ruptured gas lines burst into flames. As the neighborhood burns, Shara's building also catches fire. At one point, I smelled smoke, and I smelled a lot of gas. I couldn't move. I was totally incapacitated except for my right arm. It would take three and a half hours and the bravery of one fireman to save Shara's life. They told him not to go back in because of the, the gas, because of an aftershock might bring the building down. But he stayed with me until he got me out. Throughout the Bay Area, the powerful magnitude 7.1 earthquake has left a trail of destruction. It is the strongest earthquake to hit the region in nearly a century. 
But nowhere is its lethal force more evident than along one of the Bay Area's main expressways. There are cars and trucks that are smashed completely. I don't know how the hell we're going to get them out, okay? We have one woman who's unconscious, bleeding from the head. She is breathing. She's got a pulse. The shock tore through a mile-long section of the elevated road as commuters like Kathy Scarpa headed home from work. And I remember looking straight ahead, and instead of now having freeway, there was a rise of concrete, almost like a tidal wave. I just remember thinking, oh my God, brace yourselves, we're in trouble. The booms and the, the thunderous sounds were the worst. Kathy and seven of her co-workers were riding in a van on the upper level when the road in front of them collapsed. The van flew forward, then crashed down to the deck below. Kathy was pinned in the front seat. There was an eerie silence. Um, after, after all this thunderous crashing had ended, it was um, very, very quiet and very calm. The first thing I remember hearing were um, some moans. Kathy's legs were crushed, her liver lacerated, and both her arms broken. But she survived. Five of her friends and co-workers in the van did not. This is Dolores, Donna. There's a part of me, being as a nurse, thinking I should have been able to help these people. And um, that's something I've had some real difficulty with the guilt of surviving and not being able to help them. That is the most difficult. In all, at least 41 people died on a one mile stretch of freeway. An earthquake is one of the most powerful forces in nature. A large one, like a magnitude seven, can unleash as much energy as a 10 megaton nuclear explosion. Quakes are caused by the movement of the Earth's crustal plates. Here along the San Andreas fault line in California, two plates are grinding and jerking past each other at a rate of about two inches a year. In other parts of the world, these plates, which float above the Earth's hot mantle, are sliding beneath each other in a process called subduction. This can trigger massive earthquakes. Like this one, which crashed building facades in downtown Anchorage, Alaska in 1964, during the biggest earthquake ever recorded in North America. The 9.2 shock was enormous. The shaking lasted three minutes, shattering buildings and twisting roads and gas lines. Within seconds, the broken ground lifted as high as a two-story building, in some places, shifting dozens of feet toward the sea. Get out of those lowland areas and head for the hills. The tidal wave is expected to hit at this point almost any time. The violent motion triggered giant tsunami waves, walls of water 90 feet high or more that battered the coastline. left shipping docks in shambles. The disaster claimed more than 100 lives. In the Mojave Desert, far from the people and buildings of a major city, the sheer power of an earthquake is written on the land. The Emerson Fault, one of many that carved through this arid terrain, had been dormant for thousands of years. In 1992, it suddenly awoke with a tremendous jolt. The power of an earthquake can change the course of one's life in a second. But it is the power of the human spirit that allows us to triumph over disaster. I'll still feel the pain and the hurt and the loss um, of my friends, but it has gotten easier. The pain has gotten so much better. I mean, it's dramatic. Everybody has emotional scars about traumas and things like this, but people were so wonderful. It's just amazing how everybody pulled together. People will need to pull together again as the Earth begins to move beneath Japan.
In the pre-dawn hours of January 17, 1995, most of Kobe, Japan, is sleeping. Suddenly, an earthquake strikes. Cameras in all-night convenience stores record the severe shaking. Within minutes, ruptured gas lines explode into flames. Within two hours, fires engulf entire neighborhoods. The earthquake triggers a disaster of devastating proportions. When the smoke clears, the human toll is staggering. 5,500 people are dead, and Japan is in shock. The uh, major infrastructure, roads, highways, bridges were all damaged. Gridlock was extensive, and fire rescue personnel, ambulances, they couldn't get to the scene. Mark Gilarducci is a search and rescue team commander from California. He was at a conference in Japan when the earthquake jolted him out of bed. It was almost unbelievable that, you know, I traveled all this way to Japan and now am right in the center of, of one of the largest earthquakes to hit a metropolitan area in, in the history of Japan. It was very frightening. Although the country lies in one of the world's most seismically active regions, the extent of the destruction in Kobe had not been anticipated. The shock measured a magnitude 6.9, a moderately large earthquake. But it struck directly beneath the city and produced near record ground motion. Entire neighborhoods crumbled from the shaking. Buildings thought to be able to withstand an earthquake of this size buckled and collapsed. Most of the dead were found beneath the rubble of their homes. In a country with one of the most advanced earthquake building codes, how could so many structures fail? What contributed to the tremendous damage in Kobe was a combination of structural vulnerability, very strong ground shaking, and uh, problems with soils. James Goltz was also in Japan when the earthquake hit. He is a policy analyst who specializes in earthquake hazards. There were clearly residential structures and other buildings uh, that were badly damaged or collapsed which did not meet uh, the current building code. Those buildings were vulnerable and when the ground motion of that earthquake struck those buildings, they collapsed or they were very badly damaged. As the drama unfolded in Kobe, Californians paid particular attention. One year earlier to the day, Los Angeles suffered an earthquake with eerie similarity. Relax. All unit battalions, report on Blue 4. All units, be advised, we have sustained a major earthquake in the L.A. Basin. Please report to dispatch. Like Kobe, the fault broke beneath a densely populated area in the dark before dawn. The community of Northridge, at its epicenter, was particularly hard hit. The shaking ruptured gas lines, sparking spectacular fires. For some, like Luisa Grimaldi, it seemed like the end of the world. There was so much, so much flames that I could, I could feel the heat in my body. I could feel that I, my, my body was hot. I saw the houses burning, one to the next one. People screaming, crying, yelling for help. I thought, this is it, we are dying. In and all this is gonna be on fire, and we are all dead. That's what I felt. The shock produced near record shaking, similar to Kobe, cutting off electricity to the area and shattering water lines. As the sun rose, the extent of the damage was clear. Buildings and parking structures had crumbled trapping people beneath the rubble. 
Freeway bridges were ripped apart. One of the victims, a motorcycle policeman on his way to work in the dark, fell to his death when the bridge he was on suddenly disappeared. In all, 57 people died. Oh, 16 of them in this apartment building, where the bottom floor was so completely crushed that early rescue crews didn't notice the damage. This place was snapped in one second. We heard an explosion, a big sound. It was not an earthquake, it was an explosion. That was the sound of all this thing coming off, all their stilts, all at one time from that big first jolt. The apartment building had been three stories. But when the earthquake hit, the columns supporting the garage underneath shattered. The entire complex collapsed on top of those sleeping on the bottom floor. You underneath that? Okay, he's right underneath here. Um, my husband witnessed several bodies in, in the bottom floor. One lady that was still alive when he first saw her, she was crushed about uh, on her bed. There's about two feet of space, and there are beams on top of her. Everyone who died in this building died for nothing, because this building should not have gone down on the 6.6. Coming up, why the mighty are falling in an earthquake. When earthquakes strike, it's the falling structures that kill. In Kobe, the traditional houses with heavy roofs and light walls were a primary cause of death. Engineers in Japan are now using this hydraulic-powered shake table to test earthquake-resistant construction. Designed to hold structures weighing up to 1,000 tons, this device can simulate the way the ground moves during an earthquake. In Soviet Russia, scientists once cabled entire buildings to massive seismic machines to simulate the force of an earthquake. Three, two, one. Dr. Tom Henye demonstrates an American shake table. This experiment is uh, illustrating what tall buildings might do under an earthquake shaking. Structures of different heights will vibrate more violently under certain conditions. What the engineers learn is incorporated into new construction, like these freeway overpasses in Dr. Henye's hometown, Los Angeles. We're passing uh, underneath one of the newest and most impressive freeway interchanges in the world. It's built with a modern engineering technology to prevent collapse. But it isn't until an earthquake strikes that we learn how well the new designs actually work. The results can be alarming. We learn something about how structures perform in every earthquake. The biggest surprise in Northridge was the discovery uh, of damage to steel frame buildings. Buildings constructed with steel beams and columns like these were believed to be earthquake proof. But this recent laboratory test shows what can happen to their steel beams during a strong earthquake. Where the beam and the column are welded together, stress from the shaking causes the joint to crack. It's a potentially disastrous problem that earlier laboratory tests failed to disclose. We didn't know uh, prior to Northridge that we had a problem with steel frame buildings. Now we do. And we're going to modify the code and we're going to put into practice changes that will make those buildings safer. Strengthening old buildings and retrofitting bridge columns with steel metal jackets are some of the methods used to keep structures from collapsing. But the technology doesn't come cheap. In poor developing countries, inferior materials and construction methods continue to claim lives. In 1970, a devastating earthquake struck the northern mountain region of Peru. The powerful shock flattened buildings made from adobe brick. Entire towns literally disappeared from the map. As bodies were lifted out of the rubble, the death toll climbed to some 66,000. Those who suffered the most were the poor, as is often the case in an earthquake. 
We could construct buildings that were very resistant to earthquakes, but as the resistance to earthquakes and uh, other hazards increases, so does the cost of construction. Where the level of acceptable risk lies is a policy issue that has to be resolved by government and, uh, and the private sector. This is a tremendous dilemma in all societies uh, that face a seismic hazard. When a building collapses, rescuers face their own dilemma. How to save survivors who are trapped before time runs out. All right, let's go. One more. One more. Let's go. Raise it up. Go. Rescuers giving their all to save lives, often putting their own lives on the line. All right, man. In 1985, in Mexico City, deadly mistakes cost many rescuers their lives. In a matter of seconds, the capital of Mexico was plunged into chaos. The earthquake and aftershocks that rocked Mexico City were a major disaster. Hundreds of buildings were destroyed. Thousands of people killed. And hundreds more trapped. The wall fell on top of me. I try to protect myself and a huge block came toward me. I tried to get out in 20 ways, but it was impossible. The only thing I saw was a horrible darkness. It took 26 hours for the rescuers to find me. Those hours seemed an eternity. For rescue workers, the challenge that faced them was daunting. I personally uh, never imagined that I would see or experience anything that I saw or experienced in Mexico City. And as I looked around in every direction, all I saw was gigantic buildings in a heap of rubble. Doug Kopp saw these scenes of devastation on television. With a small hammer, you can break that away and go to the He rushed to Mexico City to volunteer in the rescue efforts. He's been working disasters around the world ever since. One Doug Kopp went to Mexico and a completely different person left. I dropped everything I planned to do with my life and completely changed course. Despite the dedication of people like Cop, many rescuers in Mexico paid a high price for their help. There was a lot of uncoordinated rescue efforts that took place in Mexico City. Many people died. Many rescuers or would-be rescuers were killed as a result of unsafe rescue operations. There was a problem of lack of people who had experience because up until the Mexico City earthquake, no international team really went anywhere to get any experience. 191 survivors were pulled from the rubble. As many as 100 rescuers were killed. We learned a lot from that particular event. In fact, it was the Mexico City earthquake that got us to refine the development of an urban search and rescue response system. The system would prove critical in Southern California. When disaster struck Northridge, California, Highly trained rescue units went into action. The most urgent effort was to save a man named Salvador Pena. Firefighter Isidro Miranda was gravely concerned for Pena. When I first saw how he was trapped, there was a little bit of skepticism because I had not communicated with him at that point and all we could hear were moans. Three floors of concrete parking garage were on top of Pena, pinning him inside of his truck. He was saying, please, please help me. Please help me get out. And then he would make reference to Dios, may I you there? God, please help me. Help me get through this. As rescue crews drilled on top of the rubble, Miranda and another crew tunneled below. No one knew how long Pena could hold on. He was in a severe distress, and he was in fear for his life. Then suddenly, 
Pena grabbed Miranda's hand. Yeah, there was the patient right there. He was still able to recognize that we were there. And by him being able to squeeze my hand, we felt like we had a chance to rescue somebody who was facing catastrophic disaster. But the rescuers faced their own dangers. Aftershocks threatened to further collapse the structure. Beat them all the way around. The crews labored seven long hours, breaking up the concrete and dismantling Pena's truck. Finally, the moment they'd waited for. At that moment, everybody felt like we had won a championship game, a battle of some sort. It was a great feeling at that time. It still is. I feel very content, very happy to have a new life. First, because of God. Second, because of the help that came from the rescue teams in this country. Peña was lucky in more ways than one. The collapsing beams that fell on top of his truck created a void space that saved his life. It's what rescuers look for after an earthquake. When I search a building and I crawl through a building, I crawl through space. And if somebody was in that space, they wouldn't be hurt. Voids are found next to large, bulky objects. The bigger the object, the stronger the object, the less it compacts, the bigger the space is going to be. When the concrete falls or the material falls down, it tends to fall up against these items. The piece of concrete will come down and be bent over like this, and under here will be a survivable space, what we call a void space. But finding those spaces can also be dangerous. Fiber optic cameras like this are a critical tool. It's what firefighters use to locate victims after the Northridge earthquake. After knocking a hole in the wall, the camera is inserted, then rotated 360 degrees, searching the darkness for survivors. The camera allows one rescuer to quickly survey a damaged building, instead of putting many rescuers at risk. In a disaster, the call to duty can be a dangerous one. For those who answer, there is one powerful reward. Knowing they've helped a fellow human being. I know that there's someone that needs my help. And if, if my family was in a situation like that, I think that the people would do the same for me. I found out that every single experience in my entire life could be brought to bear to make me more successful at saving lives. I knew why I was put on this earth. The earth can shake anywhere, anytime. Where will rescuers be called next? Tokyo, population 11 and a half million. It is the super city of Japan, a financial mecca. A place where real estate prices soar as high as the skyscrapers that crowd the landscape. It is also an earthquake time bomb waiting to explode. As many as 1,000 mostly weak earthquakes strike Japan each year. but none so devastating as the earthquake that struck Tokyo in 1923. It was the most damaging earthquake in the history of Japan. The quake and the fires that followed nearly decimated the city. More than 140,000 lives were lost. In one horrific incident, a blaze swept through an officially designated safety area, killing 40,000 people. The disaster left seven square miles of Tokyo in ruins. 
Today, most experts believe that another large earthquake could hit Tokyo at any moment. Tokyo is at very high risk in the next few decades. If we have a massive earthquake in the heart of Tokyo, we're going to see devastation like we've rarely seen in the century. You could have perhaps 20 times as many people killed as in Kobe, where there were 5,000 people killed. Charles Scothrin is an engineer who lives and works in Tokyo. What we're talking about here is uh, people and buildings and infrastructure equivalent to the state of California, compressed into an area roughly the size of Los Angeles. Much of it on poor soils, sitting on several major earthquake faults. Earthquake preparedness films like this one hammer home the danger. The worst case scenario is an earthquake that strikes Tokyo on a weekday afternoon when millions of people are at work. Buildings that do not meet current seismic codes would suffer damage or collapse. Roads and bridges would crumble. And fires, four times as many as in Kobe, would burn out of control, reducing much of Tokyo to ashes. The danger that threatens Tokyo lies beneath the ocean. Off Japan's coast, four of the Earth's plates are thrusting beneath each other, spawning violent earthquakes and volcanoes. In California, geological forces building along the San Andreas fault line also threaten to rupture in a devastating earthquake. Among the most severe events was in San Francisco, 1906. The earthquake was one of the strongest ever recorded in California. Buildings that didn't crumble from the shaking ignited in flames as fire swept across the city. The disaster left 3,000 dead. If another big earthquake were to strike on the San Andreas, the death toll could again climb into the thousands. We know there will be an earthquake close to magnitude 8 on the San Andreas Fault in Southern California. We don't know exactly when. Chances are it'll be before we die. Are you setting up the... Dr. Lucy Jones is a geophysicist who lives and works in Southern California. Los Angeles is about 10 feet closer to San Francisco than it was when LA City Hall was built. It's moving and it's stuck along the San Andreas Fault, we can measure that, and at some point they're going to have to catch up with each other. In the last few decades, California has had a run of earthquakes. They've rattled more than nerves, but none has been the big one. When the magnitude 8 strikes, make no mistake, it will be the worst earthquake California has seen in a century or more. Fire department! We're going to have a lot of fires, we're going to have a lot of people injured, many people killed. Overpasses will be down. Roads will be buckled. Emergency services will be tasked and expanded to their limit. There's no question. You take Northridge and you times it by 100, and you look at a widespread area, and that's the kind of devastation that you're going to see. It may sound like a doomsday scenario, but it is a scenario based in fact. Geologists have unearthed evidence that the San Andreas Fault produces a major earthquake on average every 130 years. As time passes, the risk increases. Earthquakes occurred in 1857, magnitude 8, 1812, 1480, 1350, going all the way back to about 500 AD. So we've actually gone past by 10 years the average interval. But the San Andreas isn't the only threat. Directly beneath Los Angeles is a network of smaller faults that could unleash an even greater disaster. 
Many of us geologists now believe that, uh, in fact, there are good reasons to believe that a seven and a half really is possible within the downtown, in the metropolitan region. A seven and a half in the city is going to be more devastating to Los Angeles than the eight on the San Andreas Fault because we are right by that shaking. It'll be directly underneath our big buildings and our freeways. The good news is they happen less often. The bad news is they definitely happen. In the quest to predict when the earthquakes will happen, the Chinese look to the animals. When will the next big earthquake strike? Some say trying to predict it is like trying to predict the exact moment lightning will bolt from the sky. It is a question that seismologists have debated for decades. At the California Institute of Technology, a network of seismometers keeps track of the earthquakes in the state. The shaking is then broadcast over a system called CUBE. Every day in California, we have earthquakes. We have never had a day that there was no broadcast over CUBE. And this day is no exception. OK, what we just had is a magnitude 2.0 occurring five miles northeast of Santa Monica, which is four miles south-southwest of Hollywood. In the next 10 years, the network could serve as an early warning system, giving the public a minute's warning before an earthquake shockwave strikes. But the ability to make longer predictions isn't in the forecast. In seismology, we, number one, we don't know what makes an earthquake start, and we don't know what makes it stop. We're still trying to figure out some very big fundamentals. You could show somebody that a fault is likely to go in 50 years, and as a result, all kinds of preparations are made, and 100,000 lives are saved. You know, imagine the way you'd feel about that when you're 70, and, and it happens, and people's lives are saved. You know, it's a tremendous uh, challenge to, um, to try to do something heroic. At the heart of the puzzle is one overriding question. When the ground moves, does the Earth send out some sort of signal beforehand? In China, they believe it does. For centuries, the Chinese have had their ear to the Earth. Nearly 2,000 years ago, they invented the first earthquake detector, a bowl with an instrument inside that drops a ball from a dragon's mouth at the first sign of a tremor. The Chinese were also the first to predict an earthquake. Every earthquake is unique. And so every earthquake has its own particular characteristics. Jean Chu is an American scientist working for the Chinese government. She has researched one of the most famous earthquakes ever predicted, China's Haichung earthquake of 1975. The Haichung earthquake had a whole series of precursors. And I actually asked the earthquake scientists in, in the province who had monitored and predicted it. And they said if it hadn't been for the whole series of signals, taking one on its own would not have convinced them to alert the community. For months, the Chinese monitored the environment. They noticed odd phenomena like snakes coming out of hibernation and other strange animal behavior as depicted in this government film. But more significant was a series of four shocks that happened just before the earthquake struck. On February 4, 1975, a strong tembler hit Haichung. The city was completely shattered, but relatively few lives were lost. Because experts had predicted the earthquake, the people were warned hours in advance. One year later, residents of another city, Tongshan, would not be as lucky. In Tangshan, there were also a series of uh, signals that the Earth gave out. And they were monitoring those signals, but they were also looking for seismic signals, which the Tangshan earthquake did not have. The earthquake struck without warning virtually obliterating Tongshan. At least 250,000 people died. 
It was one of the most devastating earthquakes in history. Only about a third to a half of earthquakes are preceded by foreshocks, and Tangshan was not one of them. Intrigued by the prediction efforts in China, Dr. Lucy Jones made research trips to the country during the 1980s. She came away disappointed. It's a mistake to think that because there is a prediction before one event means that you'll always be able to predict the other ones. How can we predict them when we don't know what's the process that causes them to occur? We may never be able to predict exactly when the ground will move. It's a secret the Earth refuses to give up. Earthquakes are an integral part of the Earth's life cycle. From the destruction comes new understanding about how to live with nature. And from the pain and suffering of a disaster comes the compassion that is part of man's nature. People come out of the woodwork. Doesn't matter whether he's a ditch digger or a barber. He'll come out and roll his sleeves up and go to work. And you come back two days later, he hasn't stopped. You see as a community, a surge of uh, pride, a unity, a come togetherness. Volunteers are what makes the difference in major disasters around the world. You find those people all over the place, all the countries. It's good people. We can never tame the Earth's fury. But we can try to understand it and survive its powerful force. Next on Abrams and Bettis Beyond the Forecast, Lime Teeth coverage of the monster storm slamming the Northwest. And when you know how to survive a blizzard on a mountaintop, Dr. Marcus shows you firsthand what to do.